good morning or good evening, depending on what part of the planet you are in. I'm Paula Nutting, your musculoskeletal specialist and uh, also facilitator for these great sessions that we have getting um, high-powered professionals to answer your questions. So these formats are called Ask Me Anything and we've got between 45 and an hour for you to actually jump into the chat box and ask those dirty questions that you've ever wanted to know about either clinical reasoning or massage or chiropractic or whatever your your uh, thoughts are for today whilst uh, we introduce and have a great discussion with previous massage therapist, now chiropractor, Michael Copland. So Michael's from the US of A and we'll be getting Michael in to join me right about now. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Michael. Good to see you. Hi, so great to see you. It's even especially good to hear you. I love that accent. Your accent <laughs> is terrific. I was expecting that, but you know, you never know. We've yeah. been Facebook friends for some time, but uh, now we're now we're verbal friends. Yeah, isn't it fantastic? And I'm dying to get over there again. Dan has just said it's your first one. Fantastic, Dan. I'm so glad that you actually get a chance to be here and be live and and be present for the um, for this hour. Um, and a lot of people will know you, Michael, because we've been spreading this information out uh, in Facebook land, but in a lot of the pages and groups that you've been involved in. And you've been quite heavily socially conscious, I suppose, in these industries. How long have you been involved in in the social platform of massage, like in, in um, Facebook land? Well, I you know jumped into the LinkedIn days. Um... Gosh, the years go by. It's hard to keep count. Probably 10 years ago, maybe more. Um, and then, you know, Facebook groups for massage. And there were, short story, short background, there were four or five of us who, a little disgruntled with, uh, to be honest, some of the naysayers in massage. Uh, so we created our own group. A lot of pe people think it's my group. Uh, truth is, there was about four or five of, of us who started uh, the group, the Massage Body Work Forum. And yeah. uh, it's been going for several years now. Yeah, I remember when that started, and I actually did think it was your group, but I'm, I'm glad to see that you've got a few administrators or facilitators because it's a big job running something. And and that's a, that Bodywork Forum, it's a great platform. So if people are listening to this and go, where am I going to get some good quality research information and just general good, strong content, mm -hmm. that that. Massage body work is a cool place to put your, you know, please can I join info. But aside from social land, and we can get into meta because I was talking to someone about meta marketing today. I can believe mm -hmm. you can buy property on the meta market, which mm -hmm. I won't be doing. But, Michael, tell us about your background. How long have you been in the industry? Because you started as a massage therapist, right? Um, yeah, I've been in it for some time. Um, I started at an early age. Um, I mean, the beginning of my backstory after graduating from college, uh, I was actually involved in a motorcycle accident. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I was pretty physically as well as uh, mentally, emotionally uh, devastating for me. Uh, it's pretty down and out for some time after that motorcycle accident. And yeah. uh, it's funny, I was actually accepted to law school. Uh, but did a 180 where I was just trying to heal myself and, you know, went to the traditional medical doctors. They didn't really have any answers uh, for me. And, you know, long story short, I ended up kind of, I was ready to forego everything, had a backpack on all my belongings in the backpack and ended up in Boulder, Colorado. And okay. I ended up in a household where, as it, fate would have it, there were a lot of uh, healers and practitioners in that household. They were a little bit older than me. I'm 22 years old at the time. And there was a yoga instructor, a rolfer, a gestalt therapist. Uh, and there was a teacher at the Boulder Massage School uh, at, in this one house, sharing a big Victorian house. So I landed there and I was couch surfing for a while. Um, <laughs> And I realized I just needed to heal myself. That, that was my mission in life. And I became immersed in kind of everything under the new age sun. Um, yeah. You know, doing my yoga. I was with the Buddhist Center, meditating, just nutritional, um, you know, means. And I was heavily influenced by these people. 
Well, uh, to cut to the chase, uh, massage and chiropractic care really saved me. That changed my life. Uh, so that took you from that injured, injured body into something that, that you could, body, mind, and spirit, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, you know, everyone talks about, you know, the buzzword biopsychosocial. Um, well, I needed it on all levels. And, you know, the chiropractic care for the spinal work primarily, uh, the massage was, you know, invaluable as far as, I mean, massage is so powerful. I wish massage therapists understood how powerful what they're doing really is. And yeah. I know there's a big buzz about the research and, the, you know, meta-analysis and all of that. But if you talk to pretty much any massage therapist, there almost seems to be a gap between what they see in their clinical reality where they're changing people's lives, yeah. uh, you know, mentally, emotionally, consciousness, perhaps, um, as well as, you know, physically uh, in many ways. So I, I was completely absorbed by receiving massage, uh, helping me. It was the one of the instrumental ways that I got healed during that phase of my life, you know, along with the chiropractic care. Yeah. Tell me, because um, I know uh, I've been involved with a gestalt therapist years and years ago and i think that would be really like that's a valuable tool as a as a introspective mm -hmm. way to look after yourself a lot of people out there will be listening to this and not know what a gestalt therapist is can you give a like a, a small like what she or he did and, and did you get any use from the gestalt work or it was mainly on the massage side while you were couch surfing <laughs> um, yeah, I think I need a massage to help me from sleeping on the couch as well. <laughs> uh, you know, gestalt therapy in a nutshell, uh, a medical doctor, PhD, Fritz Perls, created it. If memory serves me, it was actually during maybe World War II where he needed to quickly uh, help work with people. Uh, oh. And but anyway, you can you know look up the history of gestalt. It's it's another therapeutic means of getting in touch with. Uh, your emotions, how you're feeling, uh, yeah. and how you get stuck in certain issues, traumas, dramas in our lives, uh, and helps us to, you know, of course, break free from those. Yeah, yeah I, remember, I remember hearing this. We went to this Gestalt therapist when I was first dating a fellow. We thought, let's go because we want to take our baggage as as we've got our own baggage and to be able to, to mm -hmm. recognise that we don't, we're not transporting that across to the other person. And it was really great. It was great. No drugs. Gestalt therapy is a fabulous mm -hmm. tool just to to find out how to manage mm -hmm. your own mess, I suppose. Yeah, you can confront it. And with a you know good teacher, and I was with an ongoing gestalt, uh, gestalt group of us, probably five or seven um, for about three years. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's really good interpersonal dynamics, you know, yeah. group encounters to kind of express and cathart, like you're saying, you know, different... Uh, yeah. emotional blocks that we might have yeah god i remember putting writing the the etherical problems i had and putting them into the imaginary balloon and letting the balloon go and mm. everything was like up and powerful versus wanting to dig a knife into the back <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> negative experience because we want to be enlightened and lifted and, and at an energetic level we know that like if someone comes into your clinic with in a dark space they're much mm. harder to treat the tissues are harder to treat because they're they're overrided by the, I suppose, the neurotransmitters of the brain. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, it's, you know, I'm sure everyone listening realizes that it's good to try to acknowledge and honor people, meet them, uh, you know, on the, on the tone level, if you will, where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's good to let people, of course, feel safe around us. Uh, yeah. It's not like they're necessarily... Uh, process them, you know, emotionally when they come to us for massage or any form of body work. But, it, you know, it's still good to, um, you know, they, they get a sense that you have an empathy of where they're coming from at the least. And, you know, that's really important. It is yeah. really important. That empathetic touch from a therapist to their client or patient is a part of the, I think it's part of the, the placebo health journey that we have because, you know, we're not actually touching them at that stage, but they are intuitively mm -hmm. understanding that that mm -hmm. we've got their best interests straight away and then we're changing at that, like, at a cortical level. Yeah, absolutely, because, um, you know, as we all know, um, as soon as, especially a new client or patient, when they meet us for the first time, 
uh, there's a lot of signals and meta signals that they're reading about us. You can tell a lot about a person from the body language, the energy, if you will, they put out. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, I guess, messaging, you know, they're trying to, that they can pick up about us and they want to feel safe uh, and that know that we're, you know, paying attention and conscious of their state that they're in as well. That's, that's really important. Yeah, so true. So how long did you do massage and how did you segue from massage to chiropractic? Because that's really cool and very interesting. Yeah. Um, well, you know, like I was saying, uh, massage was so powerful in my healing process um, that I decided I wanted to uh, become a massage therapist. Um, I wanted to honestly go through the school. I wanted to be part of that whole process of learning all about touch because uh, I just felt massage is so powerful, so unbelievably powerful where, um, you know, kind of view the, the body when you're touching someone, it's so much more powerful in some ways than like psychotherapy, uh, even gestalt. And I know they're kind of apples and oranges, um, yeah. but it's really powerful to be able to, to mainline someone's nervous system through touch because that's direct. And when I was doing massage, um, I, I felt like it's almost like an instrument, a person's body that you get to retune the instrument like a piano might be a little out of tune and uh, maybe some bad songs metaphorically have been played on that piano meaning the person has a lot of traumas uh, in their life uh, stuck patterns etc and when you're massaging them you have a chance to literally um, kind of impregnate a different uh, consciousness a different integration into their nervous system in a very direct way yeah, um, yeah. and that's Part, that's kind of how I got into massage. But I know there's the aspects of the lymphatic you know, drainage and uh, getting muscle spasm to uh, decrease um, and calm, you know, reduce pain. And, and all of it is, not, one is not better than the other. But for me, you know, I got into it mostly for the psycho-emotional consciousness of kind of retuning and changing, um, you know, people's... Uh, situation you know yeah, their life yeah. situation in a lot of ways through massage and that was so, it was that at boulder that's what you were saying that was the university of boulder yeah i was in massage. boulder colorado um back in the day for those who don't know boulder colorado and to this day it's it's a it's kind of a power center it's a it was a huge huge mecca for a lot of the new age um transition and birthing and evolution that was happening in america uh, I mean, other places were too. We used to always say there's Boston, Boulder, Berkeley, uh, the three Bs, Boston being on the East Coast, of the United States, Boulder kind of in the middle, Colorado and Berkeley. Uh, but Boulder, uh, for whatever reason, uh, was a real hub. And uh, we tease and say back in the day in the late 70s uh, in Boulder, you could be at a bus stop and someone would process you. <laughs> <with whatever. laughs> um, there's a fellow, a Dr. Frank Lloyd who I think was doing spinal reflexes over, and he was in, uh, was it Boulder? Actually, may not have been Boulder. I think he was, but he was at Durango, Colorado. But that's okay. kind of all in that same space, isn't it? All very uh, yeah. new age and mm -hmm. and like moving forward when it comes to body work or mm -hmm. and body and brain. Mm -hmm. So how long were you massaging for? Well, let me go back a moment, if I may, because, um, yeah, I mean, keep, we can jump anywhere. And like you and I were saying yeah. before this began, we could easily spend eight hours on this. Um, and I, I do want to get to areas very soon that hopefully the listeners uh, find very helpful and yeah. can relate yeah. to some of the stresses and struggles that I encountered, which I'll get to in just a moment, uh, and ways that I found out of it and how uh, massage therapists can be helped, again, with stresses and struggles they might be uh, experiencing in their practice. Um, Boulder at the time, also, it had the Rolfing Institute. It's still there. The Rolf Institute is in Boulder, um, okay. the Naropa Institute, et cetera. But Boulder at the time had the number one massage school uh, in the United States and arguably in the world, some people say. It was the Boulder School of Massage Therapy. And uh, I took every elective they had. So back in the day, uh, it was an 18-month program, so a year and a half which, um, you know, was, was a long time back then. And I know Canada even has like a whatever two-year or more program. Um, but we ate, breathed, slept, massage. It was just a, 
an amazing time in my life. I feel very blessed that I got to, um, you know, live in that era where we were all like one big family. I know there's a lot of quibbling now in different factions of massage, but it was, you know, really one big family. We supported one another. We realized there's a lot of diversity of techniques and approach with massage, and we respected them all. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm happy I, I got to, you know, experience that. So anyway, I went to um, the Boulder School of Massage, and then what I did when um, I got out is I opened the Denver Massage Center. In Denver and Boulder, it's it's like a 20-minute drive back then, okay. and Denver's a larger city. So uh, that was really exciting. It was an innovative massage center uh, because those of us who are a little bit older know that massage back in the day wasn't well accepted like it is now. Uh, no. It even had some seedy connotation to it. You know, what kind of parlor are you guys running here? So we were really on mission to bring, you know, therapeutic, reputable massage to America to help usher that in. Thank God. Uh, so the Denver Massage Center was, on the one hand, it was a success. But one thing that we learned, and I think this is really important for a lot of massage therapists out there, is that our hands-on skills uh, were really good. And I'm not bragging here. They just were. We, we practiced massage a lot. We loved it. We were in passion. We were skilled at it. And I know probably everyone who's listening in on this, I'm sure your hands-on skills are top quality too. And that doesn't mean we know it all. And I'll be the first to say, never stop learning. Learn new techniques if you want. Keep refining and mastering what you do. Take Paula's classes learn from her, learn from the masters. If there's one single bit of advice I can give you, the greatest way to accelerate your practice, your life, everything is learn from people that are masterful teachers, mentors. Um, yeah. Nothing else replaces that. It really doesn't. So, you know, if you haven't taken Paula's classes, you know, learn, learn from her. There's others out there, a lot of fine teachers. Um, yeah. But, you know, what we believed and it turned out not to be so true. We thought that our hands-on skills are really good. And here we have this beautiful massage center. And there were several of us practicing there that we believed that because our hands-on skills were good, that clients would uh, keep coming to us. They would comply with you know whatever suggestions we made. They would be repeat visits. Our client retention would be really high because they loved our work. And after all, if they loved our work, wouldn't they just keep coming back? And wouldn't they refer others? Wouldn't they be excited to tell everyone, oh, you got to go see these guys? Well, that happened to some degree, but not nearly as much as we had imagined it would. Okay. And to be honest, we, we weren't at capacity. We, we were a little frustrated. We were, you know, a little stressed, a little struggled to see more clients to reach a capacity. Now, something uh, that happened, it's kind of funny almost looking back or, or fortuitous. What happened was some of our clients, because now keep in mind, I've been receiving chiropractic care along with massage. And some of our clients who we realized that they had locked vertebrae, they just needed chiropractic adjustments to release them out. And, um, we actually referred them to a trustworthy chiropractor, chiropractors that we knew. And, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of funny because I remember at the time, I, it's funny you can remember things emotionally that happened, you know, decades ago. I was thinking, this is really suicidal. Here we are wanting more clients and I'm referring them out thinking, well, <laughs> again, right. Uh, yeah. You know, the chiropractor is going to keep them or hoard them, which is a big fear. A lot of people have. But uh, so unfounded, isn't it? Like it, it it's, reverse when you think about it you, you know it now granted some would do that i mean some are hoarders you know there's practitioners who are hoarders as i call them you know in uh, different professions um but yeah you see where this is going so what happened and unexpected to us you know we were surprised because you know we, we didn't know the ropes um not only did the chiropractors reinforce the need for these clients to come back to us which then validated what we're doing even more because, you know, the chiropractor said so. Um, the clients trusted us more. Yeah. Because why? Well, because they sensed our level of uh, honesty, integrity, and 
that it's funny there. I mean, there's like 200 client management skills, so to speak, that's in my course, client management mastery, but we kind of stumbled upon one, just one, like knowing how and when to refer clients out. So it so upgrades your professionalism, the trust factor increases. So the clients came back to us and then because of the trust factor was so great because they trusted, we knew how to manage at least that one area of their care, they started referring others. And so we had practices that were, I mean, super successful. It's like a waiting list practice um, to get in to see us. So well, from one ethical choice, it mm -hmm. changed your, your clinic around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, let me add too that, um, you know, we tried a little bit of advertising and I know that, you know, you see the ads on Facebook now or um, some of these sponsored ads where people are, can, can do very... Um, progressive advertising for you. And um, I, I just always put a word of caution with that, where, you know, when you advertise, it can be a little bit costly, it can be a hassle. And uh, what we discover is you can end up with some shady clients. And, yeah. and, and you have and that more over in America, we don't actually have that, thank goodness, that, that call to action to bring clients to you but that's not that's not a big thing in australia but it's massive over over your way isn't it um yeah well i think you know there, there's a lot of promoters and marketers and everyone's looking to you know make money and i'm not and i'm not dissing that they i'm sure they help people they can bring in they can boost your numbers um but where i'm coming from is i try to teach or i do teach massage therapists how to uh, retain clients to stay under your care and how to get quality referrals without having to advertise. And that's yeah. a whole other topic. In fact, I call them the three R's, which I'll get back to in a few moments. Everyone wants the three R's. I'll tell you what the three R's are that we all want uh, in just okay. a moment because I don't want to sidetrack too much. Um, and so, yeah, we had the respect, the professionalism, and we had the repeat visits, referrals that we wanted. But you know, I'll be honest with you, and maybe some of you can identify with this, even some of you who may have uh, pretty successful practices. And we, or at least myself, I'll speak in first person. Uh, even though I had the numbers, the clients, I still felt frustrated. I really did. I felt um, kind of less than the other practitioners, the chiropractors, the osteopaths. And... Um, Part of the reason for that is I felt you know, kind of inadequate, a little bit confused with how to manage so many areas of client's mm -hmm. care, which honestly is not taught in the massage profession. No. It's, it's really not. I mean, there might be snippets of it, little tiny pieces. Um, and I know that you know people use the buzzwords of clinical reasoning and assessment and evaluation, but from what I've seen, um, it's more like a token way of expressing those terms. And uh, granted that people that are teaching hands-on classes uh, may have really great assessments and evaluations within what you're teaching uh, with all due respect, but in a broader overall sense of learning how to evaluate, assess uh, clients all the way through the course of care with you and measure and monitor their care. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, missing in the massage profession yeah. uh, it wasn't there when i was in the massage profession and honestly um i spent part of the reason to go back to what you're saying initially that i got involved in social media was i had been doing full-time chiropractic for many years um and that's a whole other story I actually retired years ago from chiropractic with a divorce i was raising my kids uh, for five years and started missing chiropractic. So I came back in part-time um, 10 years ago or more and love it more than ever. Um, but what I realized during that interim was that I thought maybe someone's come along and given the client management skills to massage therapists and realize it hasn't really happened. Now, what spurred me uh, to to want to learn this myself, which is going to lead into why I went to chiropractic college is when I would observe the chiropractors. Here I'm doing massage and massage practice was great, 
But me personally, I felt frustrated, a little confused, a little inadequate, not knowing how to manage areas of the client's care, not knowing how to answer their questions, the questions to ask. And everything with new patient indoctrination, um, they come in complaining of you know headaches or shoulder pain. How do you work this up? What are the questions to ask them? How do you know if you need to refer them out? How do you know if it's a sprain or a strain, et cetera? How do you consult with them um, and evaluate that health history form in a, in a very thorough professional way? Uh, massage therapists might, you know, we were taught one or two basic questions, you know, any serious injury to wear contact lenses, great, life face down. That's kind of what we were <laughs> um, And I would observe the chiropractors and they would even let me sit in. In fact, uh, chiropractor Michael Sasna was his name. I don't even know if he's still around. That was so many years ago. Um, and I'd watch him work up new patients. And I was like, wow, I want to learn that within my scope of massage. And then the proper exams to do that are focused on those presenting chief complaints, what findings to look for, which then really helps you get specific with your massage treatments. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A roadmap. A roadmap. Yeah. Because when you think about client management, the word management, it loses people. Um, but it really means just to guide or direct every yeah. aspect of a client's care from A to Z. So you're always... Uh, in charge of communicating it with them, and you know the protocols to go through, how to examine them, how to make treatment recommendations, short-term, long-term outcomes based on that, how to measure, monitor their progress, how to even do re-exams. And if it all sounds complicated, it's only complicated if you don't know it. But like a lot of things in life, once you're taught a systematic protocol, you go, oh, this makes total sense, and I can do this step by step. So, yeah. okay, so to shoot ahead, I realized I wanted to learn the, uh, those skills. I just had a strong desire, so I went to chiropractic college. That was the main reason I went. Um, it was a tough choice. I had a great life. We, you know, we loved massage and a lot of friends, and there was no chiropractic college anywhere near Boulder. you think there would be. So that led me to California um, to go to chiropractic college. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I mean, also wanted to learn spinal adjusting to to complement my hands-on, uh, you know, massage skills. So that's how I got into chiropractic college. That's kind of the background with that. Okay, and then you. I mean, I'm going to ask questions with the how you how you like to link. You know, what what part of the human body will you go? I'm going to do soft tissue. Then I might do joint. Then I might go soft tissue. But um, you, before I go back to that, you are teaching in, in a chiropractic school, or you were. What's your, you're involved in chiropractic association? I, like I know that you're more than just a chiropractor. You've gone on mm -hmm. you're involved in the in the actual chiropractics. What's mm -hmm. what's your? You obviously you want to give back, right? Uh, well, I think chiropractic itself. To, to give you a direct answer, um, I was also with a practice management group for five years, and a lot of people were thinking, well, "What does that mean?" Yeah. Well. Believe it or not, when you go through chiropractic college, yeah, they, I mean, it's four years. It's pretty extensive. And you learn how to do clinical reasoning, assessments, even diagnosis and all that on patients. Um, but the missing, there's kind of a missing link there, believe it or not, where practice management groups, which exist for chiropractic specifically, teach you how to kind of link it all together, especially through uh, other procedures that are patient management based that encompass the clinical reasoning assessment and diagnosis. A lot of communication skills, and they even teach you things like how do you generate referrals from your current patient base, which is really important. Yeah, um, that. And um, that, I think it just lost me on the screen or something. Yeah, changed. Just, no, no, they're just doing a, a quick, a couple of piggies that'll come through here. We might okay, see you soon. Fine. Cool. Sure you still, still hear me. <laughs> Um, yeah, never done with the internet thing these days. So anyway, I was five years with a practice management group, and um, between that and the uh, client management skills I learned in chiropractic, the practice management group, um, honestly, I ended up with one of the most successful practices in the nation. They told me. Oh um, man. Yeah, and because yeah. it was just so, we were so impassioned with this this knowledge, these skills. And I was teaching them to massage therapists who I referred patients to. Some worked in our clinic. 
and all together ended up teaching these protocols procedures to um, my guess is over 3000 practitioners at the time because they're just so powerful. We just wanted everyone to learn these because it's so up levels your, your success. It gives you satisfying success with the numbers of clients that you'll be seeing. And like I said before, you no longer feel confused or frustrated or less than because you know uh, you're aligned with a lot of the standards, protocols, procedures that the chiropractors and osteopaths are using. So, you, so you're empowered as a massage therapist. So in short, um, you have your hands-on skills as a massage therapist. And then when you combine them with client management skills, wow, you know, that's um, supercharged. You kind of have a complete yeah. package. So you provide the best overall care. Yeah. And when you think about it, what it does in the big picture is it in, in, there's implicit safety that your patients come to see you or clients come to see you. That increases. And your risk matrix would drop down considerably because if you're actually following a protocol and not just saying, are you wearing contacts, take them out, lie on the table, um, mm -hmm. then, then we're going to be picking up red flags. We're going to be picking up yellow flags. We're going to be picking up um, just some of those, those reasons that we might need to refer earlier. Even, even prior to doing the, the other management act, um, mm -hmm. aspects of it. So, you know, we're just getting it. You're, you're establishing something that people can follow a pathway that's clean and streamlined. And the other thing that I like about what you're doing is that people are, okay, my massage therapist does the same stuff mm -hmm. before I get on the table as my osteopath does or my chiropractor does. So that it's giving that professional level that mm -hmm. next step up. So, I did, yeah, it's a really, really clever way for massage therapists to actually align themselves up with some of the other allied health professions. So well done. Yeah, well said. Well said, absolutely, because a couple of things to your point, and, I mean, you're right, you're right on point with what you're saying because um, some massage therapists, you know, hearing this, um, or think, well, this isn't for me. And I'm the first to say this isn't for everyone. It's absolutely not. In fact, on the website that I have up now, which it's, you know, mildly under construction, um, I put a disclaimer, this is not for everyone, that if you really don't want to learn advanced client management skills, and all you want to do is, um, you know, just more, more hands-on only, this is not for you. You're not going to like this. Um, yeah. And some people feel, let me just throw in real quickly, um, that, wow, do I really want to, like, get into all this, you know, more educational stuff I have to learn and responsibility um, with learning client management. My response is exactly what you were saying. You're so on with this, Paula, that once you learn this, that you actually become uh, freer mm. to dance within your certainty because you have confidence, you have assuredness, you have direction, you have clarity about how to manage every area of your client's care. So questions yeah. they might ask, uh, a huge part of client management is communications. So you know how to answer them. You know what questions to ask them. So that's yeah. that's a huge part of it. Your, your competency not only increases in your credibility, just like you were saying, uh, but wow, you know, your, your confidence, your assuredness um, oh. take this to a whole other level once you know how to do these skills. And then again, that's why I wanted to learn them. I was just yeah. tired of not, not knowing them as a massage therapist. And, and it takes nothing away from massage. You know, people that don't want to learn this, that, that's fine. You know, it's not a, you know, make them feel less than or a guilt trip. And a lot of massage therapists are completely happy with what they, they already know and do, and that's great. Yeah, and they have the same niche following and they have uh, the same people. Of the, the, the people that receive that treatment tend to, uh, will refer to the same people that, that actually are drawn to that. But I know there's more and more and more massage therapists coming out and mm -hmm. are around to treat, and we've got um, an expectation of how am I different to the next therapist? Mm -hmm. So what makes me a reason for you to see me versus Jane or John or whomever yeah. down, down the street? And how am I going to increase my, my profitability, increase my quality, and, and I believe that that if you charge if you charge a low number, it's because you don't believe that mm -hmm. you are allowed to charge more. Yeah. And I've I've always worked on the other way around it. If you provide professional behaviour 
and can apply like really good sound reasoning, et cetera, and offer strong advice and good home care and referrals where they need to be referred and contact between the referees, then you should be charging, you should be charging an amount that people then go, there must be value because a, I see what I'm getting. B, uh, like I, a per, a, an example of what I do is now that I've put my prices up again, I actually will do a quick um, YouTube, like I'll do a, a, a Zoom video mm -hmm. and say, hey, Dana, thanks for coming in off the treatment last uh, yesterday or this afternoon. Don't forget what I want you to do is we're going to get some shoulder extent, uh, extension going on here because you're a little bit you know, curled in. This is the stretch here. This is the such and such, and these are the notes. And then I upload that, and then I send it to them. So people are then getting a reminder, and they go, "All right, wow." So I know, I know, Dana's had family who lived in Colorado, have cousins in Colorado. So, um, but it's the kind of how do we establish that we are professional, mm -hmm. and what that looks like, and it doesn't have to be about fluffy white table cloths and it doesn't have to be about paying for rent in an exorbitant place because you go well I'm, if, if i'm buying expensive towels and paying a lot of money for for a rental that makes me better than the next person because it doesn't it's your internal knowledge mm -hmm. skills and academia and exactly what you're you're offering here michael is is a way for people to be moving forward onto that yeah yeah absolutely and and you know like i've said it's kind of a missing link uh and that's why i took on the project i mean believe me this was a labor of love uh you could ask my wife and like you know <laughs> um, i mean hundreds of hours to kind of put it together um basically you know in a nutshell synthesizing what we know you know in the doctor realm and my years from uh practice management all combined together how do i kind of code that so it's a usable system for massage therapists. And it, it was tedious, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. And, you know, we'll see where it goes. I, I think it's one of those things that might take, you know, several years for the profession to really catch on to it. And I know some people have the attitude, well, if we really wanted to learn this, we would have just become, you know, chiropractors, osteopaths, maybe PTs. Uh, and that's fine. Like I said, it's not for everyone, but it is for those who take their uh, practice seriously and that they want to provide uh the best of their ability and the best overall care you know, for yeah. their clients um, absolutely and people yeah. see on the ticket tape down there it says www.mastersinmassage.com for more info so you can jump onto michael's uh, site after we finish don't be rude don't leave already um and you can actually have a look and see what michael's got to offer because it sounds like there's there in, in small like there's there's individual blocks or the whole the whole shebang is that how it's offered people can um, do units of study yeah well a quick a quick answer uh to your question is um when i created the client management mastery course um some people asked me if i would take subsections of it and create little books so the books are there you can get them on uh, amazon like how to take soap notes which is an entire chapter of the whole course uh, how to do professional exams um, and uh, how to treat whiplash. So there's a few courses within the master course that are on the site. Uh, oh. You can just go directly to clientmanagementmastery.com if you want to mainline. In fact, there's a sale going on now uh, for that course, you know, the home study course. In fact, here's the, I just had, DVD, some people wanted DVDs that surprised me. Here's oh, so hold on, all right. The client management, massa, management mastery. So I might get the guys below who are in the background. Oh, That's yeah. it. See, yeah. they know. And we might pop yeah. that down in the ticker tape too. Client Management Mastery. Wow, 23, 28 C points for CMT, BMC. I can never remember the acronyms for that. It's a lot of letters. It's a lot of letters, but they're <laughs> great guys over there. Yeah, so I'm online. And, and the DVD, I'm surprised anyone uses D DVDs anymore. I was shocked. And I was talking I to Eric know. Dalton about that, um, you know, friends with uh, Eric, and he he has so many DVDs. And yeah, no, I, I had to move all mine onto USB and then it's and then downloadable, yeah. but who knows? All right, so I want to get, so if people have got questions that they might want to ask about, you know, how, if they're a massage therapist and they want to know um, 
some questions from a chiropractor. Here's the person you want to talk to. Pop them in the in the in the comment section, and then Michael can answer them for you. But what I want to know, Michael, is if if you've got someone who's got a real some of those clients who come in and they're really 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 super stiff and blocked mm -hmm. in their backs and mm -hmm. could be lower back. It's normally you know the, they come in and they're you know they look like that Ken doll. Do you like them to get a massage before or after the adjustments? What's what's the, what would you prefer in a chiropractic world? Yeah, that's a big question everyone wants to know. Uh, in the description you gave, if they're super tight and that's going to impede the efficacy uh, of the adjustment and um, it's going to be difficult you know, to get through the, the muscle mass, if you will, uh, to adjust the vertebrae, then of course you want them to be relaxed out first. Um, for those who aren't familiar with spinal adjusting, I mean, you don't just blast through the muscles. You want the patient to be completely relaxed, completely relaxed, and you know, then you go ahead and adjust them. And uh, you know, it's funny because I tease patients a lot where they say, Oh, I feel a little bit uptight, a little bit nervous about being adjusted before I come in. And I'm half serious, half teasing. I say, Well, you know, try to do a hot tub if you can. I keep wanting to put a tequila bar in the reception room up front so that'll <laughs> calm you down. And you know, in California, if you want to, you know, smoke your pot or drink your wine, I mean, whatever it takes to just relax out. Seriously, um, do a bit of stretching. You know, send people to other rooms. They want to stretch for a few moments. I think the challenge, as we all know, in our current culture, everyone's just so busy. Most people they're kind of zipping in, zipping out, and they're you know stressed and on the computer ten hours a day. Um, but yeah, ideally, if they're super stressed get a massage first. If they're not and the adjustment goes fine, then I highly suggest adjusting them first. And okay. okay. And the reason for that in a sentence is because if the spine is locked and it's pinching the nerves coming out, so the nerves coming out from the spine, the peripheral nerves go to everywhere in the body and control the muscles. If the spine is locked, pinching the nerves, there's an inherent signal telling the muscles to stay somewhat tight. Yeah. And that's yeah. part of what got me into chiropractic when I was doing massage full time. You can massage someone until, you know, the cows come home over and over, but the muscle still stays hypertonic mm -hmm. and there's indicators, the vertebrae are tender. They're not moving on interverbal range of motion, et cetera. They need to be freed up. Yeah. So, yeah. So perfect world, get into a spa or chill out or have a, have your tequilas or, um, a, I, I like the idea of just getting in. I think some, some chiropractors will do an assessment and then put you on blocks for a while. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that kind of, yeah, it's a different technique. The SOT, as it's called, they, they do the blocks. I mean, I always tease and say we should have a Valium dispenser uh, on the front door for some yeah. people just to have them relax out. It's um, amazing. Isn't it? Valium at a low dose is muscle relaxant and the next dose up is for here. So I, in my nursing days, we used to, be prescrip prescribing the, the 10 milligrams, not the five milligrams. Wow. Oh, well, yeah. No, that's those, really good. Those the old days. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I didn't know you had a nursing background. Yeah. 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 I, eight years in ICU. So we were oh, wow. about it. So I'm you glad I'm not you. in the ICU space right now. I'm getting tired of wearing masks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we still will be for a while. Um, but, um, and so we should. I mean, if, if you've got your head face to face with a client or a patient mm -hmm. and you're down over the top of them, I just think generally you should be mindful of mm -hmm. whatever bacteria or garlic is yeah. coming out of your mouth <laughs> for yeah. them. I mean, even even pre-COVID, you know, I would always say that during the flu season here, we should wear masks anyway just yeah. to back on the viruses. But Yeah, Southeast yeah. Asia have been doing it forever. Yeah, they, they always mask in their colder months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is a, a common phenomenon. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone's actually going to ask any questions around um, the work. So another question from me: What mm -hmm. um, if you're doing? If you've got a, a patient that comes to see you, how how hard is it for you not to try to do massage techniques during spinal adjustment, or can you fit both of them into your clinical space? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, number one, um, I refer or recommend. Uh, to every patient that they should be getting uh, massage, you know, full session massage, which I do not provide that. Uh, 
we have two because I don't have the time. You know, I'm more I'm focused on more spinal adjusting, and we have two massage therapists in our clinic now. And I have oh gosh, four or five at least who I've known over the years, different specialties of what they do: lymphatic person, uh, just general Swedish person, you know, the pregnancy person, so to speak. Um, and I refer to them, but I recommend it to all patients. Uh, to answer your question, what I do uh, is depending on how tight the patient might be in a focal area, so say the neck, if the muscles are really up tight in the neck, um, I'll spend a, upwards, you know, five or 10 minutes at most, honestly, uh, trying to calm the area down. I'll use basic like PNF uh, yeah. release type of work. I even have a uh, massager, you know, the vibrational device that I'll put on for a few moments sometimes. Um, so that's, that's kind of the extent that I do, the, uh, again, because of the time, you know, restriction and all of that. So I know some yeah. pract practitioners might spend, you know, like 40 minutes doing a lot of the cranial sacral and various massage on patients. Uh, I don't do that. I'm too busy. I refer them out. So. Yeah. How, how, with, with cranial sacral therapy, how much do you think... And I don't know much about it in the in the space of, of spinal adjustments and, and the nerve restrictions, but the, the, the link between the, the two, because craniosacral, we're looking at the cerebral spinal fluid that's mobilising up the spine, up mm -hmm. central of the spine. Does that have um, much, like should people be having craniosacral before they come in to calm their nervous system down? Like, well, you know, when I get asked, these questions and, you know, by people, by patients, um, I always say I'm an easy sell. And then I think it all works. It all has its place. Yeah. And there's the ideal world, the, the should be world. And we teasingly say in, in the should be world, someone should have 40 minutes of cranial sacral. Then they should have a nice relaxing massage on top of that. They should go into the psychotherapy or gestalt room for, you know, visit that person. You put them on the gurney and take them down the hallway <laughs> through physical counseling, uh, exercise, counseling, and chiropractic adjusting. I think we all know that. There's so many avenues or aspects that affect our health. And the way my mind works is, okay, uh, very few people are going to do everything and spend the time, the money on everything. And everyone's in a different place in their life with what they're willing to participate in, both in their self-care, um, nutritionally exercise, stress management, et cetera, and how they access us as practitioners. And, you know, I try to honor that. Mm -hmm. uh, so ideally, yeah, everyone, it'd be great if they could have a 40 minute cranial sacral session and they could have a session with you. And I'm sure other people listening to this have tremendous, uh, work that would be great for patients, but, you know, playing the doctor role for me, I'm, kind of triaging primary chief complaints. I start with that. Someone comes in, they've been to the medical doctors for their headaches and they don't have a medical pathology. Can I help them? I go from there. And, yeah. you know, you can't just tell someone, well, you need to change your whole life. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, you can't go into, and you certainly can't go into nutrition and diet in the length of time that you've got in, a, in, a, in your clinic because yeah. that's a whole new world. Yeah, and some practitioners do. I used to do nutritional counseling years ago, and I stopped. Honestly, um, that's a whole other story. Yeah, and it's that's like I think fun. the I think the dirty little secret of nutrition it's ninety five percent about what not to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always say it's quality over quantity. You can eat pretty much everything yeah. as long as you don't shove this much in your throat, yeah. um, because your inflammatory markers can handle little yeah. bits of everything. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I did tell patients just for the record, a new patient and, you know, we give them printouts that if you have any questions that I could help you with, with, you know, exercise, stretching, nutrition, stress management, uh, any of that, even sleep patterns, you know, what kind of pillow to use. I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't preach anymore. Yeah, and that's it, nice. That's you know, nice. So, I mean, someone who's 50 pounds overweight pretty much knows they're 50 pounds overweight. It's not healthy for their spine. They don't, they don't need to be preached to. But. Oh, yeah, and, and they're the ones that walk away and they don't return. You don't get repeat. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. They, they, they don't go much places. Now, Christine's asked, how does a chiropractor help back pain or do I, or do you have any simple advice on how to treat it uh, in the comforts of your own home? She's been having back pains for a while now. So if they can't come in to see you, how could they 
Is there any, any tips that you could offer Christine with her lower back pain? Yeah, well, Christine, you know, it's always tricky in these the context of an interview or social media where I'm kind of playing doctor and, um, you know, unlike TV shows in the real world, there's a lot of questions I would have to ask, you know, to, uh, before. I mean, back pain is kind of generic, you know, uh, a lot of questions. I mean, I, I spend upwards of 45 minutes sometimes with, with a new patient going through the health history, the consult and the exam. Sometimes it's only 10 minutes, you know, you know, but questions, you know, just to throw out a few, I mean, you know, how long have you had the back pain? Was there initial injury? Was there trauma involved? When did it happen? How often does it occur? Is it constant and chronic or is it intermittent? Uh, what provokes it? Are you just having an episode now? Is it something you live with? Uh, who have you seen for this? What treatments have you tried? What are the results? There's a lot of questions. Have you had an MRI? Do you have a permanently bulged disc? Have they discussed surgery? I mean, there's so many realms of, you know, what causes back pain. Yeah. Um, yeah it's kind of, it's kind of, honestly, I'm not trying to dodge you or, you know, not give you a great answer, but it just depends on a lot of factors. I don't really have that information now. And that's part of your course, isn't it? That's oh, actually yeah. having people to understand how to ask those questions. Is there any any way to help improve posture by simple by doing simple routines daily? For posture, yes, I would say that that's a probably easier question to answer because it's postural based, not pain based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you can imagine, I mean, my answer to that is um, always you know see a qualified you know massage therapist and chiropractor. I and mean, see where I'm coming from is having kind of been involved in everything in healthcare. Um, you definitely want to have massage to for all the benefits it provides to reduce a lot of you know psychosomatic holding patterns. If the vertebrae are stuck, they they have to be released. It's square one, and you can't do it yourself once they become seriously locked. Otherwise, you wouldn't need chiropractic. Uh, but once you take care of those aspects, arguably, um, if you have any serious you know tr traumatic stuff you know in your emotional field, that should be cleared out. So that's always a given. And then, like Paul is saying, you know, the fundamentals, do, do your yoga, do your stretching. And in the cultural epidemic now is everyone's kind of, you know, hunched over with the computers and texting and devices and all that. So we're trying to counter that by bringing the posture back. And, you know, contrary to what you might see on social media, postural uh, compression forces are hugely detrimental. They lead to maybe not momentary pain, but the long term, tremendous uh, negative impact on the spine, on the nervous system, and can lead to degenerative arthritis. So posture is very important. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you have this term over there, but in out, over here we call um, sitting is a new cancer. Yeah, yeah I've That's heard that. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people are sitting too long and a lot of people sit, especially with, with, mm -hmm. with being in isolation, mm -hmm. that has increased people working from home and you don't have the the HR person to come and set up your workstation at mm -hmm. home. Yeah. We started off um, just when people were in full lockdown. I was just showing people get get your ironing board mm -hmm. and put your computer on the ironing board and put it against the wall and have it at a height that you're standing up. That's the only way you're going to do a stand-up desk that's going to yeah. fit your height because an ironing board can, can mm -hmm. go up or, or down with the sliders. So you can actually not be sitting all day. And, and movement... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't move it, you lose it. So getting up and moving around. What what you just said, the last thing you said, in my opinion, is the best answer we have for people now. And, you know, the mind tends to go in either or black and white. Should I be standing or should I be sitting? Mm. And it's amazing to me. I, I live 25 minutes from Silicon Valley. OK, I'm in the beach town and right over the mountain of Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah the capital of computer land. Yeah. And yeah. so many patients are on computers all day. And they're brilliant people, but they're so disconnected from common <laughs> sense sometimes. And I have to talk to them like I'm talking to a fifth grader in terms of, should I be sitting or should I be standing? And I got my new you know, monitor, which should I do? And I say, keep moving. Yeah. Move, shift, sit for a little while, stand for a little while. Um, even if you're not in a perfect posture for moments, you know, you're kind of kicking back like this for a little while, feet up on the, that's okay. Do yeah. that. 
And then a few minutes later, you're going to shift and you're going to be like this staring. That's fine. Keep moving. Mm, mm. Oh, it's, yeah. look, look at your cat. And they talk about, you know, fascial movement of animals. You know, if they've been sitting for a long time, they'll go through full range. Yeah. And it's yeah. just an instinctual thing that we don't do. We'll be sitting and then we'll get up and we'll, we'll short movement patterns and there's not mm -hmm. the, the action of moving is so good for the body. It's great for the lymph. It's great for the nervous system. It's certainly great for the joints. Oh, and, I mean, it's everything, cardiovascular and affects, you know, the, the moods, the neurotransmitters, I mean, all of that. And it's, I mean, it's kind of a bizarre time in history, isn't it? When you think about for time immemorial, people were toiling physically out of the yeah. fields of slaying dragons or whatever. Um, it was a very physically, you know, hard life. And suddenly it's like 180 degrees where people are just sitting all day. And they're yeah. and they're battling that, like trying to find a way to create movement. Yeah, interesting but, time. And then we've got that the meta world that's just been introduced, the new Facebook meta. And I I only learned this today is that you get a a, a v your virtual reality, your VR glasses, and you set up your virtual world, and people can buy blocks of land where they can put market like so. McDonald's has got. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that they've bought land so they can put up the McDonald's logos and advertising. So when you are sitting on your bum at home with your VR glasses on, roaming around your virtual world, uh, they, you're seeing marketing. So there's your advertising straight off with, with different, different companies. But you're doing less here. And it's just, it makes me feel sick inside. That's what yeah, we're doing to ourselves. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's hard enough to be in this world to find the time to interact. And the, I think the further we get removed, that's a whole other story. And, you know, people might disagree, but I think it's it's not great yeah. for the you know, yeah. humans have been a long time. And I think we need to interact. And, and also, you know, to state the obvious, I think this is one of the reasons why it seems that more people than ever are flocking toward massage. They need the human you know, con, uh, touch the human contact. And I mean, yeah. all the benefits that massage provides aside, just the social connection being yeah. around someone and touched by someone is, I mean, super valuable, more needed than ever. Yeah, it's and a blessing. We, you and I, my friend, have one of the most fortunate jobs on the planet. And we have a, 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 the ownership to respect people because they allow us to touch them. And mm -hmm. look at the world. You've got um, massage, chiropractic, osteopathy, physiotherapy, um, hairdressers, but uh, manicures, you know, beauty therapy, but not even not, not even personal trainers are actually in, over here anyway. They they can indicate what position they want to put you in, but they're actually not allowed mm -hmm. to touch. So we're we're the few, not the many, and that's it's you know it's I always thank my clients and thank my patients for the capacity to allow me to touch mm -hmm. them. And yeah. I don't think that we value that as much. And that brings us right the way back to the start of today where you were talking about the importance of connection and touch and how mm -hmm. touch affects us here as well. Yeah, and we all know the studies that are, I mean, decades old now where the studies with the babies who were not touched versus touched, and we can see it in society at large that, you know, um, and it's it's just bizarre. I mean, if you were to bump into someone in the you know grocery line, bank line, first thing you says, "Oh, I'm sorry. I'm you know I touched you. Wow, I'm so sorry," because yeah. you know you're not supposed to touch people. Understandably, I get it. So, you know, I think people need massage. You know, again, more than ever, it's just so powerful and such yeah. a healing modality on so many different levels. I mean, we could talk for hours about the different ways of massage. Um, we could. We could because there's so many great modalities to choose. However, I've taken an hour of your time and I know that it is, um, what do they call it, twilight hour or, you know, that that have a, have a break time and, and you've probably been working all day and it's about time that you could put your feet up, rest mm -hmm. back, grab yeah. a Merlot and just chill out. 
Yeah, sun's going down here. Let's see if I turn the light on. Yeah, we're, wow. so you're 18 hours ahead of me. Is that what we established? Yes, it, it's midday for me here, which is 1 p.m. for the other Australians on Eastern right. Daylight Savings Time. And it's right. And so, and so we talked about since you're 18 hours ahead of me, you could give me tips on the ball scores and stock market. <laughs> <laughs> yes, apparently I can, but uh, I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'm, shh, we'll tell everybody after we we're, after Our we're little finished. Secret. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for coming on board. It's been an absolute delight and, and a fountain of knowledge. And I really hope that any therapist out there that that watches this um, a little bit later and it'll be in, in Michael's page and hopefully it'll be able to be saved in your uh, massage uh, movement body workers that, that your group for a, a bit of time. We can drop this into there for people to watch if they want. Oh, I love that. Please, please do that for me. If you have a recording of this, because a lot of people have asked me, they, you know, they were, even my wife, I mean, she's a massage therapist and uh, of 30 years and she's, she's seeing clients now. You know, she, she works a lot in the evening. She likes that when they get off of work and she was saying, we're kind of getting a re in recording of this. And uh, we'll, we'll grab it and we'll put the link into your group. So that oh, group. Please so do, yeah. Yeah, we love that. that. And yeah. Um, yeah, are we are we time restrained? I mean, I could keep going. I don't know. Do you want to end it at now? Is this a good time frame for you? I mean, it's so <laughs> enjoyable talking to you. I'm just so excited to get to meet you, and you have, you know, you're just so smart and have all the right questions, and it's a real pleasure. I mean, I really thank you for having me on board with you. And yeah, anytime, I would love to join. Oh, in. We'll, we'll we'll come back. We'll come back, and and if I can have you back again sometime later, and we can talk about how the course has been going and what's been happening and, and anything new that we might have to offer. I've got, I've got my team that can only be here for a certain length of time and I've got, a, I've got a patient in 30 minutes and I've still got to prep my room up. But it has been an absolute, it's been an absolute, absolute cracker, mate, as yeah, we say. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thanks uh, for those who are joining. I really appreciate it, yeah. Yeah. So look look out for this. This will finish up in the Massage Mentor Mastership Program. This will finish up with you guys here for this ongoing KIP recording. We'll drop it into Michael's group for probably about two or three weeks um, so that people get a really good chance to watch it. Ask questions because it'll be it'll be in the chat box in the ask questions section, which means that Michael will be able to get in and, and be able or the admin team be able to get in there and see those questions and uh, he might be able to answer more of those. And we'll also make sure that we've got the links to the courses that you're running. So, um, Michael, it's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Be well. Thanks. Be in touch soon with you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.